So with that background, I'm going to um, uh, dive in by uh, introducing our moderator today, who's going to really run our show. Our moderator is Professor Jeffrey Liebman, the Malcolm Weiner Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He studies tax and budget policy, social insurance, poverty, and income inequality. His government performance lab provides pro bono technical assistance to state and local governments interested in improving the results they achieve for their citizens. We are really, really lucky to have him today to be our, um, our moderator, and he is going to kick us off and introduce our panel. Jeffrey, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Karen. And so thank you so much for uh, assembling this extraordinary event. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our discussion today about universal basic income. We've known for at least 50 years that our safety net has big holes in it, that benefit levels for SNAP and SSI and families with children are too low, that asset tests and benefit phase outs trap people in poverty, that the way our welfare programs are administered can be dehumanizing and discourages a significant number of people in need from receiving benefits, and that there are some unpopular groups in society who need assistance, but our political system makes them ineligible for benefits. What's exciting about the current moment is that after all the years of careful research studies uh, that are sitting on people's shelves and of sensible policy proposals that seem to have gone nowhere, there is this guaranteed income movement that is trying to prove that it really doesn't need to be this way. And I've been surprised at how quickly the movement has contributed to major policy change in Washington. The 27% increase in SNAP that the Biden administration implemented in August, the expanded child tax credit uh, in 2021, um, but I'm also a bit confused about where this is all heading. How are all of the 100 person pilots that various cities are implementing going to accumulate into a knowledge base that informs future policy? What is the policy end game that this movement is building toward? And I'm so excited to be serving as your moderator today um, because we've gathered the nation's leading experts to help us make sense of all this uh, extraordinary activity going on. We're gonna start our session by grounding ourselves in the existing evidence. Dr. Amy Castro Baker will kick us off with a brief presentation summarizing the available evidence and the knowledge gaps. Dr. Castro Baker is the assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania in the School of Social Policy and Practice. She co-leads the Center for Guaranteed Income Research at Penn and serves as the co-PI of the Stockton Economic Power Empowerment Demonstration and is involved in many of the other demonstrations in cities around the country. Um, Amy, over to you. Hey there, thanks for having me. Just give me one minute to set up my slideshow, which I believe I can do. One second. Okay, do we have that correct? Excellent, okay. And if I do anything uh, wrong, I'm told that there's uh, there are some amazing IT folks behind the scenes that can assist. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Dr. Castro, I'm from Penn, um, and I'm the co-PI of the Stockton Experiment, um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And so what I'm gonna do to kind of kick us off here and get us started is I'm really gonna start out by ground, you know, like sort of grounding us in the evidence from Stockton and what we know so far, and then talk a bit about implications, sort of, you know, it was a small study and, and talk about where we're headed, and then would love to um, kick it off to the rest of um, our agenda so to make sure that we're leaving ample time for questions, which I find with this topic tends to be um, the most important. So with that being said, there we go. So just to kind of give you a quick overview of, of SEED and of Stockton for those who aren't familiar with it, um, we are a small RCT. It was a random sample of census tracts that were at or below um, area median income, which in Stockton is about $46,000. We used address-based sampling on that particular research study. Um, lots I could say about that. I'll, I'll hold back today. I'll, I'll hold back my research <clears throat> nerd self as much as possible on design, even though I'd love to talk about it. Um, we had 125 people in the treatment group, those who were receiving $500 a month, no strings attached on a prepaid debit card. We had 200 in active control, meaning those were participating in all the same surveys and data collection activities as the treatment group. And then we had 153 in passive control. And those are folks who consented to give us access to their administrative data, which will be following those, those families over many years. 
Um, and just sort of to, to um, anchor us in some terminology here, we're talking specifically about guaranteed income when I'm referencing the Stockton experiment. And that means it's a recurring fixed amount that you can rely on each month. It's not a UBI. A UBI by definition would go to everyone in a particular city, county, state, uh, you know, things of that nature. Okay, goes forward here. I'm terrible with slides. All right, so our key research questions, why were we studying this? What were we even trying to do? Um, we basically had three key research questions with SEED. The first was asking the question, how does guaranteed income impact monthly income volatility? Second, how do changes in income volatility impact psychological health and physical well-being? And then third, how does guaranteed income generate agency over one's future? Uh, now, the reason we sort of are framing our work this way, and if you're familiar with the other pilots that we're rolling out across the country, we're asking similar research questions in each site, is that this idea, sort of the fact that people's income is going up and down each week, each month, basically constantly, right? It creates, um, you know, not only a lot of unpredictability in the market and unpredictability in people's finances, but it really shows up in the body. You know, the way that I like to say it to my students is that the failure of capitalism gets under the skin. And we see that in terms of um, poor public determinants, or excuse me, poor social determinants of health. Um, and it shows up in, in things like families and in households, and also in the way that markets react to react to people when they're trying to seek things um, like mortgages and car loans. Okay, so first income volatility, what have we learned? And just to, uh, you know, be clear, the findings I'm talking about today are simply from our first year, this is pre pandemic data, we'll talk about and release the second year um, of data in spring of 2022. So first income volatility. Um, and the way that we got at this was asking, you know, would would you be able to pay for an unexpected $400 emergency expense with cash or a cash equivalent? Uh, you can see here that at baseline, the beginning of the experiment, um, treatment and control, about 25% of people were able to pay for a $400 emergency expense. Fast forward after one year of the pilot, and 52% of those in the treatment group were able to afford that $400 emergency expense. Um, now, on the face of it, that's sort of obvious, right? So if you give people more money, they're going to have more money, right? Like it's not sort of a spoiler alert there. But what's really important here is that what we saw with these families was that that liquidity really smoothed over shocks that otherwise would have pushed them into poverty or at risk of eviction, right? So it's the proverbial, you know, flat tire that leads, causes you to lead a shift at, miss a shift at work, and then and then you suddenly can't pay your rent. Um, the other thing that was really interesting with this particular group was that people were able to really pool those resources across fragile family networks, really alleviating strain from unpaid care work, food insecurity, and other gaps um, within the community that just simply were not covered. Um, and then our second research question, how do changes in income volatility impact psychological health and physical well-being? First, uh, recipients, those who were in the treatment group, were less anxious and less depressed, both over time and compared to the control group. And then second, they reported improved emotional health and well-being, um, energy over fatigue, less pain, um, both over time and compared to the control group. And if my co-PI was here, she'd be telling you that this is her favorite chart of all time. Um, so <laughs> what this shows um, is health and well-being over time. Now, it, there's, there's a lot you can see and, and the chart kind of speaks for itself. But one thing I just wanna highlight here is that almost every single member of both our treatment group and our control group met the clinical criteria for either anxiety or depression at the start of the experiment. That's extraordinary because we typically think of, as, of mental health as being separate from the economy. And what you see here is that at the start of treatment, you know, both groups met the criteria for mild mental health disorder. But fast forward one year and you see the treatment group drop completely into likely to be well. Um, and that's simply from just giving cash. Um, that's not providing any other type of treatment. Um, these decreases in anxiety and depression and really extreme financial strain really increased people's capacity for goal setting and being able to cope with unexpected shocks, obviously the pandemic and other things um, of that nature. And the reason this is important is because when we are sort of so consumed with not being able to pay our bills, um, when anxiety and depression are taking up so much bandwidth, um, it really limits how people show up for each other, um, and it limits their capacity to really set alternative pathways, which means that even when you show up with an amazing intervention that may be helpful, right, people simply don't have the capacity or the bandwidth to be able to engage with it. And then our third research question, how does guaranteed income generate agency over one's future? 
We saw this in three categories. Um, first, changes in employment, which is probably the thing that's gotten us the most press for good or for ill, um, depending on who you talk to. Um, second, changes in risk taking and goal setting. And then third, uh, freedom from forced vulnerability. So first, employment. Um, the start of the experiment, only 28% of people in the treatment group um, were in full were in full time employment. Fast forward one year, that number had jumped up to 40%. So contrary to sort of um, popular belief, if you give people cash, they will not stop working. Um, it, it, like we see this evidence in Stockton. And of course, these are not labor market effects. This is how a small group of people are reacting to a local labor, labor market. But what we learned when we followed these families over time was why those shifts took place in employment, which I think is probably the most salient thing when we're talking about the landscape of guaranteed income research. Um, first, the $500 we found removed material barriers to full-time employment. Uh, and you know the words of this participant right here, they said the one thing is definitely risk. You can take so much risk. So what we saw happen over time was that in that first six months, families are really stabilizing their household finances, paying back utility bills, covering food, covering those basic expenses. But once they did that, and that sort of economic volatility was smooth, and anxiety and depression dropped, what they were then able to do was to take a breath, sit back and say, how do I wanna reimagine my future? So in many cases, people knew they were eligible for things like full-time employment, internships that would lead to a better job, but they did not have the time capacity or the cognitive capacity to even jump forward and do that because they were so limited and constrained by working too many hours a week. Um, now for women specifically, the scale of this was curtailed somewhat by the limits of care work and how much they had to perform in the home. Um, the last thing I just wanna say about this piece right here is to really um, hone in on the fact that financial scarcity generates time scarcity. I think we forget about this, is that time is a luxury good. When you are experiencing poverty or you are struggling to make ends meet, you are spending so much time trying to get access to basic services and even move around the city. That time scarcity really shows up um, both you know, financially and then also in the body in ways that limit people from engaging with other policies and programs in the community. Um, and then finally, freedom from forced vulnerability. I won't spend too much time on this for the sake of time. I wanna make sure I get to the implications. Um, but one of the things, if you've worked with folks in poverty or if you've experienced it yourself, then you know that poverty means lack of choice. And what we saw with the $500 was that it really allowed people to move from these situations where they are forced to be vulnerable on relationships and systems that may they may not have wanted to be involved with, right? Into chosen vulnerability, with, which really hinges on authentic trust or authentic vulnerability. Um, so this could be things like people leaving relationships that they did not want to be in, or in many cases, relying on family members that they were forced to rely on rather than family members that they would choose to rely on. And we saw that the $500 really disrupted the cycle in small ways. And I think for us as researchers gives us a signal as to how we wanna think about these things moving forward across um, these other pilots and saying, what type of agency and potential are we leaving off the table when we lock people into lack of upward mobility? So just some quick implications, and I want to talk about the state of the research before we move it into everybody else. Um, first, um, mistrust or lack of trust in us as Penn researchers um, and in SEED as a program, it drove engagement with the program, it drove take up with the research itself, and it also drove spending patterns. So when we talk about communities and households who've not only been marginalized economically over time, but have also been explicitly targeted for, wealth, targeted for wealth extraction, predatory lending, they have no reason to trust the federal government, state government, or any mayors for that matter, um, when they come in talking about a cash transfer experiment. So when we think about policy take up, understanding the fact that policy has to be designed um, with that end user in mind that keeps community voice at the center of the process, understanding that people have experienced tremendous disenfranchisement. Second, um, you know, cash is not a silver bullet. There are structural limits to guaranteed income. Um, cost of housing persistently came up, cost of childcare, cost of healthcare, lack of safe market access. I could give everybody tomorrow $1,000 a month, it's not gonna do anything if people don't have safe access to banking um, and safe access to the market economy. Um, 
Third, we've really learned that we need to address false narratives about poverty alongside generating data. And I'll leave that um, to Natalie to speak about later because I know she's going to talk about that a bit. Um, so I'll set that one aside for the moment. And then just some concluding thoughts and moving forward. So we have this small pilot from Stockton. Where does this leave us? Where are we going? Um, first, again, policy take up. When we think about all the data we have on guaranteed income, we of course have our historic data and we have you know, what we know out of Stockton, which is still, you know, we're still learning, we're still doing data collection. But the way that we think about it is we really wanna avoid the mistakes of the CARES Act and the New Deal. Here's what I mean by that. When I look at any social problem right now in the US, I can trace it back to the New Deal era and those little choices that were made about who is deemed deserving and who is deemed undeserving in the safety net. Those inequalities accumulated over time such that we now have large gaps in wealth between um, you know, women and people, of, or excuse me, women and then women of color, between black households and white households. And those pieces where people were locked out just created new forms of inequity over time. So when we think about guaranteed income and we think about things like the child tax credit and the CARES Act, we need to think carefully about who is fearful of engaging with these new cash policies and how we need to prioritize community voice in that process. Um, second, um, asking the question, you know, which population should be prioritized as we roll out a guaranteed income? If we want to get towards a universal basic income, thinking about instead like, who needs to be targeted first? Who's experienced structural inequity over time? And there's a lot we still don't know about which populations benefit the most from a guaranteed income and to what extent. Um, then there, that fourth point down there is asking the question, you know, what's the amount of money that we need to have in order to promote change on different research domains? We really don't know yet. Um, we know a lot in California, but we know far less about the middle of the country in the South. And I think that those are really, really key research areas that we don't like we simply don't have data on yet. It's a different policy context. It's a different public context. And when you think about not only cost of living in each of those spaces, but how does narrative change look in different parts of the country vis-a-vis -vis where people may be located? And then um, finally, frequency, right? So how often do people need to re receive cash in a way that it will generate the strongest outcomes? We're gonna know more from the child tax credit um, but there's certainly uh, a lot of unanswered questions in this space. So I will stop there. Um, I know we're a little bit constrained on time, so I'm gonna make sure I'm leaving room for questions. Great, thank you so much, Amy. Uh, you've given us, uh, we, could, we could spend the remaining period just asking you questions, but I'm gonna draw everyone else in first, um, but you've gotten us off to a wonderful start. Um, so I'm now gonna introduce the rest of our panelists. Uh, we have with us Natalie Foster, who is an advisor to the Aspen Institute Future of Work Initiative and the co-founder of the Economic Security Project, a fund to support the exploration and, and experimentation of a guaranteed income. We have Jeffrey Canada, the president of the Harlem Children's Zone and the chairman of the Children's Defense Fund's board of directors. And we have Mayor Sumbul Siddiqui. Uh, Mayor Siddiqui is currently serving her second term on the Cambridge City Council and her first term as mayor of Cambridge. So I'm gonna start us off uh, with a question uh, for Natalie. You've helped fund and build the modern movement for guaranteed income uh, from really from its beginning. What have you seen change in the past few years and what do you think is possible to accomplish in the next few years? Great, well, thank you so much for having me. And um, Dr. Castro, that was an excellent overview. Uh, and thanks so much for hosting this conversation. I think this is an excellent, um, assembly of people and I can't wait to hear what what folks where folks land. Um, yeah, we founded Economic Security Project nearly five years ago, five years ago in November is when we launched publicly. And we were very interested in a growing conversation around creating an income floor for people given the um, resiliency that it would provide individual families. And meaning we lived in a very brittle economy where so many families could not pull together $400 in an emergency. Nearly half of American families couldn't pull together $400 in an emergency. And that was before the pandemic. So it became clear that alongside wages, which we need to rise in order for families to make ends meet, there should also be an income floor that comes in each month, no matter what, no matter what happens. Well, that became even truer when the pandemic hit. So I think one of the big shifts we've seen is that it was originally seen as an idea 
that would be a 10 year project that was very much in the margins of, of the political discussion. Um, and when the pandemic hit, it became a conversation very much in the center of the political conversation and the timeline sped up. People started imagining we could do this in the United States. And I think the, the primary expression we're seeing today of it uh, is the child tax credit. So being debated today, the future of making the child tax credit permanent. Uh, what we do know is in the American Rescue Plan, there were you know, six um, payments passed. So one, one year of the child tax credit, families started receiving those checks in July, they'll run through December, and they really are money with no strings attached. They come from the IRS into parents' bank accounts every month, near up to $300 per kid per month, no application process, no reporting back on how it's spent, simply money to raise your families, money to help cover the shocks of, uh, and absorb the shocks of, of living in, you know, this modern economy. And, um, and it sits alongside parents' wages. So it really is a guaranteed income for parents with children. So I think we will learn so much from um, that experience uh, as we, you know, the third check is out and there's still three more to go. So I think that's one big thing that we've learned is how quickly this has moved from the, the margins to the mainstream and how quickly we, we will go from pilots to policy. You know, so much of what I'm seeing are dozens, uh, actually, potentially hundreds of pilots that are popping up across the country in small cities like Wausau, Wisconsin, in big cities like LA and Chicago, who just announced their $24 million pilot using public dollars um, aimed at demonstrating what a guaranteed income would look like. And so many of these elected officials are also saying, and it will take policy to scale what I am doing in my city, right? There's no way that philanthropy can actually, you know, fund this uh, to its, its scale. It has to be policy. So I'm calling on the federal government to pass a guaranteed income. So I think that's been a big shift is, is from um, really sort of building the, um, the, the sort of questions of a pilot to recognizing pilots are demonstrating what's possible um, with policy. So with that, um, I will uh, stop if there, unless there's anything more um, you want me to cover right now. That's great for the moment, but we will come back to you very soon. Thank you so much. Um, all right, next, uh, uh, Dr. Canada, um, you've been the president of the Harlem Children's Zone. Uh, your lifelong work has tried to improve children's educational outcomes. Uh, what do you see as the potential of UBI as an anti-policy, as an anti-poverty policy solution, especially for families and children? Thank you, Jeff. Let me let me start off for one, one clarification. I'm no longer the chairman of the Children's Defense Fund. I was for some time, but so just so the current chairman won't think I'm trying to take uh, the job back. Um, the, you know, this, first of all, and Natalie is so right. About 10 years ago, I was the um, sort of chairman of George Soros's US board, his foundation board. And we got interested in the future of work. And I was terrified that because of robots and other things, we we're gonna lose all these jobs. And we began to talk to people all around the country. And this idea of a UBI came up. And we studied this thing for a couple of years and we just said, eh, it'll never happen in the United States. And we just took it off. We, we was like, this is the United States. We're never gonna do anything like that. It's just too sensible for us to grab a hold of. And I just have been shocked with seeing how this has now become part of the possibilities of policy in this country. So that I wanna thank everybody who's been working on this. Uh, the uh, impact of poverty on children is just stunning. Uh, and in this country that we would be ignoring uh, this. And we have ignored it and we've thought of it just as the cost of living in certain places, of having a certain lack of education and other things. You and your children are gonna be so poor that you're making decisions about uh, whether you're going to uh, shop and get totally unhealthy food and or, or pay your rent or keep your lights on and maybe have your children taken because you have no lights in your bed. And families have been making these kinds of choices uh, since I've been in the field and it's why we decided we just wanted to just make sure the next generation 
was not going to be uh, living in poverty. Uh, the fact that I think for the first time, the country has a sense of, I think, moral and ethical responsibility are saying we understand what poverty does to certain families. And we are prepared to say uh, that we're gonna do what we can to mitigate that child care tax credit and others, I think is the floor of this moment that we're having. The one thing, and, and I thought the presentation was, was really terrific. The one thing it, it stated, but I wanna underline, is that the amount of money that will make a difference, will vary by uh, the housing and other expenses in an area. Uh, and when I look at what's happening with homelessness around this country and how even middle-class families can't afford to live in places in America today, uh, I think that I don't, wanna, I don't wanna dilute the impact of a UBI. Uh, with the fact that in some places, the cost of living outstrips what we're going to be able to do to make a measurable impact. So we could measure some and say, hey, that wasn't the impact that we expected and think it's because of, of the UBI, but it could very well be because uh, in those places, even middle and upper middle class folks can't afford to live because of the cost of housing and other kinds of costs. So I just want to be confident, by the way, I, I love the fact that we're doing research on this, uh, but I could have just said to folks, you should have asked me, I would have told you it makes a difference. I, I grew up on welfare. I mean, we would not have made it. I would not be here today. Uh, it was the most humiliating, degrading experience in the 50s and the 60s uh, for my mother with four boys to try and get help, to try and keep the lights on and pay the rent uh, and still try and figure out how to work all at the same time. Uh, this, I think we're long past due uh, sort of saying in our uh, sort of, I'm gonna say extreme capitalist country, but I'll certainly say we're not like the Scandinavians and some of the others who really believe in investing a lot uh, in the social safety net. Uh, we need to, in, in my opinion, uh, put this floor under poverty uh, in this country. Uh, and I think that's all it is, it, it is just the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, next time we're gonna hear from uh, Mayor Siddiqui. Uh, Mayor, from the perspective of local governments, why are so many mayors around the country uh, eager to try out this idea? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And, uh, you know, I think, I think back, I joined Mayors for Guaranteed Income almost a year ago this month. Uh, and to see all the progress that's, um, you know, been possible. Uh, is truly amazing. So I think at the local level, uh, elected officials like myself, we hear from families, we hear from the community. Uh, we see uh, firsthand that families and individuals are struggling to make ends meet uh, each month. Uh, we've heard from our community organizations on the ground who work directly with residents and we hear how uh, they've been doing uh, before and during the pandemic. Uh, and so uh, us joining uh, these pilots, really, we, we've heard this a little bit from the prior speakers, but we know there's this immediate income, immediate impact, but we know there's a long-term strategy is involved as well. And I think what we've heard, we know that 34, over 34 million Americans live below uh, the federal poverty line. We've heard the $400 number and at the local level, we, we see it. Uh, and so the, the whole point of these local pilots is to support people now um, and then also uh, eventually show what's possible on the federal level. And in Cambridge in particular, we really, the process, again, I joined almost a year ago, the process started to come together to develop a pilot. Uh, and we focused on single caretakers in particular, uh, and we chose uh, about 130 single caretakers for the pilot, and we'll be providing $500 monthly um, over 18 months. And our first disbursement actually went out last month. Um, and similar to what Dr. Castro, who is uh, our research partner uh, on this, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're hoping we're probably going to see a lot of the similar data 
Um, uh, but you know, it, it, right now it is all about learning and information gathering. Uh, and so that's also what makes it really exciting uh, to be really amassing this body of evidence uh, from all the pilots across the country uh, to show that um, you know, we should have a, a guaranteed income at the federal level. The Cambridge Rise pilot, I have to tell you, was difficult to get the money. Um, we were really fortunate to get the seed funding uh, from Mayors for Guaranteed Income. And then it was all about relying on philanthropy. It was relying on our university partners, Harvard, MIT. Um, it, it was really relying on our corporate uh, partners. We were able to do it in a place like Cambridge because there's a lot of that. But as, as it ha has been stated, it's not sustainable. Uh, and it's great that all of their cities now being able to use public funds, but there are some cities like Cambridge that have a, we can't use uh, our public funds uh, due to something called the anti-aid amendment uh, to, to fund something like this. And so uh, it's great to see how the momentum has grown around this. And uh, I'm really excited just to be helping the families that we're able to help. And there's so many families who did apply and I guess we, I, I get a call to my office every day, almost saying, you know, are there going to be other pilots? You know, is there any more money? Um, you know, we need help. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very clear on the local level. We feel it, we hear from residents and um, that's why we really wanna do something about it. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask you the first uh, follow-up question. You, you mentioned the anti-aid amendment you know, Cambridge, I think, has 120,000 people living in it and poverty rate around 13%. So I'm guessing there are at least 5,000 households that could benefit from this and, and you're able to help 120 of them. What's the way you get to 5,000? Is it is it a city tax that then, uh, you know, and all the biotech companies that then pays for it? Is it the, you got to wait for the federal government to do something? How, how does Cambridge get from, from where you are to actually having a basic income for everyone who needs it? You know, I think it's going to take uh, federal and state level policy changes. Right now, uh, we the anti-aid amendment really um, prohibits us from giving any cash, uh, which is why, uh, you know, with the COVID dis Mayor's Disaster Relief Fund, we raised over 5 million. That also came directly from the community. I mean, it, it, we've, we've thought about ideas. Uh, sure, we could probably, do enough fundraising to raise that 130 single caretaker amount to maybe 5,000, but it would it would take a long time. Uh, and a tax, you know, I think we've the city, city solicitor. <laughs> I won't say it, but it would be difficult to do a tax as well. I, I think we are looking at the the policy changes um, at the national level to help us. I think the American um, Rescue Plan money is something that we are, I know other cities are utilizing. I think Cambridge, given the amount we're getting, we're getting um, above 60, I think it's between 63 and $65 million. There is a, uh, a question right now pending of, do we do, can we do another pilot that would let us reach uh, these, these uh, families up to 5,000, but, uh, and there's nothing really um, concrete uh, that's happened there. But it, I think to your point, to your question, it's going to be some uh, larger policy changes that would free up this this um, and change this law. Thank you. Um, Amy, I'm going to ask you a few questions, both for myself and from the audience, about the research. Um, the first is, um, are there, are the questions, each of these pilots is pretty small. Are the questions being asked in the research efforts in each of these separate pilots similar enough that you're going to be able to pull the results and 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 teach us something in aggregate? That's a great question. Um, so the answer is, is yes. So we are using the same common survey across. Uh, we're running, I think, 27 RCTs right now out of the center. Some of which are public, some of which are not, and and we're using that same baseline sort of research questions, and then of course instruments across all of them so that at the end of the day we will have 
a, a massive database where we're able to sort of compare apples to apples rather than apples to oranges, right? Um, the one exception being, you know, sometimes cities will add questions based on their local, you know, local context that housing matters more in some places than others, transportation matters more in some places than others, things of that nature. But yeah, at the end of the day, we'll be able to, to say something pretty significant um, with those data uh, in the aggregate. And is, what's the what's the total? Is the total roughly 100 times 27? I can, I don't think I can say just yet, but um, there are very a lot. <laughs> Let's just put it this way: um, Stockton is on the smaller side compared to the pilots that will be announced um, in, in like very near future. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, all right, another another research uh, question. Uh, where this is being hosted by the. Harvard School of Public Health. I'm, I'm curious, you, you, you obviously presented the mental health re, um, results, but what other health outcomes do you think might be affected by the guaranteed income and what else is being collected in terms of health measures in, 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 in the data instrument? Oh yeah, that's that's a great question. So when I uh, sort of get a chance, I'll drop our pre-analysis plan in the chat and that way people can see all the research questions and sort of um, scales that we're using to look at health. Some of, the, some of the things we're getting at will be through administrative data, things like hospital utilization rates. Those are things that happen over time. Um, but as far as sort of thinking forward about some of the ways that we expect cash to you know, impact health, I think one of the biggest things is prevention. So you know, what we saw in Stockton you know, is that people sort of, they'd been putting off health, you know, basic cancer screenings, for instance, or basic health care or cutting pills in half, things of that nature, things that they've been putting off for years, once they had sort of calmed their finances, they were able to start getting on top of. So one of the key research questions that we really have moving forward um, with some of these larger pilots and having a bigger end is to be able to say, do we see a meaningful change in the type of types of sort of physical health behaviors that people um, engage in when, when they're not just chasing um, chasing cash, trying to work um, to make ends meet. Oh, yeah, I see Carrie jumping in. Uh, yes, our research pilot in LA County will be um, a thousand participants in the treatment group. And then Jeff, I want to jump in on this and just say, in addition to what um, we've looked at in Stockton, we also have 40 years of a natural experiment in Alaska where Alaskans have received a dividend, you know, paid out annually, no strings attached, and some really good research has happened over the past several years, some of which we've supported at ESP, looking at, you know, birth weights have gone up, childhood obesity has gone down. Uh, there are a number of um, health indicators uh, in Alaska that you, you see a real shift on after the dividend. Um, so I think that, um, I think there's a lot of different um, literature out there and I'm really glad to see there being more because for a long time, this was just a question of like work for, you know, what will be the impact of the workforce? What will be the impact of um, you know, financial lives? And I actually think that the well-being question is where we see some of the most profound changes in people's lives. Certainly when you talk to them anecdotally, it's you hear room to breathe, feeling like I could be a good parent, feeling like I could say yes to my child when I had had a long, you know, years of having to say no, no, no. And those are the kinds of things that really stick with people and I think really move policymakers. Thank you. Um, Amy, one, one more question for you and then, then I'm gonna uh, move on for a moment at least. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that one of the negative narratives about UBI is it might discourage people from working and that your evidence uh, suggests, uh, at least in Stockton, it went in the other direction and then the Alaska evidence I think is also uh, suggests no no big negative effect on, on, on unemployment. But I'm curious what other negative narratives about guaranteed income are you collecting data to be able to see if they're 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 they're, they're uh, true narratives or or myths. Oh I mean how much time do we have Jeff? Um, <laughs> the the first thing I'll just say just for clarity um, you know in, in case I was speaking too quickly which tends to be what I do um, is that 
you know, if people work less because they're receiving unconditional cash, I'm all for that, right? Like we work too much. Americans work way too much to the detriment of our health and well-being. And so to us, it's not necessarily about whether or not people are stopping working, but what type of work are they engaged in? Is it meaningful? Is it not meaningful? Is it destroying their health and well-being? Is it not? Does it limit the way they can show up as a partner or as a parent? So we're far more interested, you know, in that and really seeing like, are people able to shift and have more agency and the type of work that they take on, um, which I think is really key. But as far as sort of thinking about narrative, um, my goodness, I mean, this is part of the reason why we're releasing spending data. So I dropped this in the chat a few minutes ago where people can go and see how the money is spent and stocked in it. And I will say that that feedback came from the community. We were not interested initially in releasing spending data because frankly, we don't care. I care far more about how spending the money impacts people's lives rather than how they spend it, right? Like that's to me pointless, like they know best what they need. But when we talked to Stocktonians, they were like, you, you better show people how they spent the money uh, because we know exactly how they're gonna spend it um, and people need to see. And so that's something that we've engaged in a long-term partnership with Juliana Bita Denori's team at Stanford Basic Income Lab. And they're gonna be our main data visualization partner across all the pilots that we're running through the center to be able to show spending data um, you know, in the aggregate, but then also show um, some limited forms of outcome data to really see like, you know, people really, they know best. And so it's, some of it's about data, but I should also say, you know, data only takes us so far, right? Like scientists tell horrible stories. We're really bad at translational work. Uh, and if we're going to have any prayer of really dismantling poverty narratives, we need to do that narrative work in the press and in public discourse alongside generating gen like sort of, you know, traditional empiricism, which is why, you know, we do things like engage in public events and, and you know, pull people out of the main treatment group to, to be able to share their stories with the press. Like that's intentional. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes that works well, sometimes it doesn't, but really engaging in that public discourse work, I think is crucial because otherwise we're just going to migrate the myth of the welfare queen off of the safety net onto the child tax credit or onto unconditional cash, right? Like I can create a UBI tomorrow, but if I don't dismantle stereotypes about, around race, class, and gender, they're just going to move to something else. So, you know, that's not a specific, you know, data point that we're collecting per se, but really saying that, you know, one of the things that's really key about the work that we're doing and, you know, MGI is doing and some of our other partners in the space is really challenging those narratives by changing their, the narrator, right? And making sure that we're centering community voice in the process, which frankly is terrifying because it means as a researcher, I have to give up control. Um, and I don't like that very much. I'd rather be in charge. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if I'm going to be true to the ethos of basic income, I need, I need to do that. Thank you. Um, Natalie, let me come back to you. Uh, I'm curious what the policy end game is. Suppose these pilots happen, they continue to have encouraging results. Is what we're heading toward an Andrew Yang style $12,000 for every American and massive tax increases to pay for it? Is it a Nixon style negative income tax where the benefits phase out pretty rapidly uh, with income? Is it grants to mayors around the country to figure out who in their communities most need aid and maybe that way we can get aid to unpopular groups that Washington wouldn't directly support? But what's, what's the, what's the, where's this all heading? Yeah, well, first I'd say this is all, this is a choice that we will be making today, right? The, the biggest way to understand the future of work is look at the choices we're making today that will impact you know, where these trends are heading. Um, I am very uh, inspired to see the child tax credit and all of the support um, orienting around that right now in Washington, DC. I mean, this is a, a major break from 50 years of policymaking that put you know, strings on things that made things very complicated for families. Uh, and this is saying no money with no strings attached to raise your families, you know best how to raise your family. So I'm very encouraged that that is a new way of thinking about social policy in America that we can build on from there. Um, last year, Derek Hamilton and a group of academics put out a paper uh, outlining a negative income tax um, in America, how we would get there, what it would look like, and the racial equity uh, that could be really in, built uh, by re rethinking our tax code. And that would simply be a floor 
under which no one can fall in the United States. Um, I think that is a great path forward, uh, a real North Star that, you know, creating an income floor in America that, you know, the richest nation on earth, there is a standard of living that everyone receives, no matter who you are or what happens in um, the labor market, this is what you get. And I think that is a type of guarantee that needs to sit alongside a suite of guarantees, a guarantee around healthcare, um, a guarantee around housing. Uh, and there's a lot of good work being done on those fronts. I think we can start first with income uh, and then move to you know, a basic bill of economic rights in the US. Natalie, if we're, if we're going to have a new means tested income program, why do that rather than beefing up SNAP or SSI or our existing income transfer programs? Well, I, I think I certainly think all of those things are important. We should, you know, leave them in place. Uh, they are supporting lots of families, but we can just give people money with no strings attached. Studies show that is the simplest, most effective way to support families. So um, let's let's build on top of what exists and build, you know, an income floor that gives people fungible cash, right? That's the thing that's so powerful about cash is that if one week it's your transmission that breaks, that prevents you from getting to work, and the next week it's paying for, you know, emergency childcare, and then the next week it's actually trying to make up that last hundred and fifty dollars to pay your rent check. Cash allows you to do all of that, and that's what families are using it for. Thank you. Um, Jeff, let me come back to you. Um, the, uh, suppose we're successful, we get all these guaranteed income programs in place. What else do we need to be doing for every child to have economic opportunity in America? You mentioned housing, but what else is missing in the suite of programs that would really make, make the difference? Well, I, I mean, I think that uh, right now, uh, part of the challenge we have in this country is still fighting the undeserving versus the deserving poor and how we think about certain families and certain communities and certain myths and stereotypes. Uh, and I just want to uh, suggest that the boldness of the child care tax credit, uh, the ability that seizing a moment uh, has on a nation is important. And we can't allow the narrative to be taken uh, and I'll give the example that, that sort of frustrates me, but, un, but underlies, I think, this issue. And it's going through the drug epidemic that happened in the inner cities in the late 50s and the early 60s, and this a decision that there was going to be a war on drugs, when this was assumed to be mostly black and brown people, and we started mass incarcerations, and it was all of this stuff that went on. Uh, versus when it began to hit white America and we started talking about a brain disease and treatment and other things. Part of the issue that I think we have to seize right now is the universal nature of these supports and not just have uh, the old uh, game of uh, I'm against it because it's for those people and those people look like they're black and brown and that's going to help them versus that this is for Americans. So I just want to say that this is a moment we can seize that narrative. Uh, and I saw some of the staunchest conservatives uh, coming out and talking about drug treatment in a way that just blew my mind. But I also knew who they were thinking about helping. And it wasn't those folks in Harlem and Bedford-Stuyvesant and other places. So I'm gonna just say that, uh, just to answer your question directly, Jeff, I think that we're, we're looking at universal pre-K and pre-K, we the kind of investments we've done in schools right now is absolutely critical. But we also, this idea of college affordability is real uh, and a post-secondary strategy that may or may not include college, but does include skills that allow you to transfer those skills from one place to another uh, to be successful. You know, we, we believe that at every developmental stage in this country, our young people should have a set of best practice opportunities that uh, assure that they can live up to their full potential. And we don't have that in lots of places right now. So we still have struggling schools. We still have a lack of uh, quality in our childcare. Uh, we still have lots of kids who don't believe they can afford college and no other options for them. We've got to start to knit those supports together around this country that goes along with the basic income. So, uh, poor families and, 
and uh, working class families can really, I think, have the options of living up to the, their child's individual potential. Thank you. All right, we're getting lots of really interesting questions in the chat, and I'm going to try to start asking them. Um, and I, um, for some of these, I'm not going to choose uh, a particular respondent, so so our, our, our panelists uh, can volunteer if they want to take a crack at, at these questions, because I'm not sure who will know the answer to particular questions. Um, so one question is, how have the broader communities reacted to these pilots? Have people embraced them, or have they been uh, divisive because people have said, why do those people get money and we don't? I can start really briefly. Uh, so in Cambridge, it's been, you know, because we concentrated on single caretakers, there were a number of two-headed household, you know, households who were really upset that there wasn't a similar program. And so um, I think there was a little bit of that, but mostly a lot of positive energy from, and a lot of other cities in Massachusetts uh, saying, you know, how did you get this going? Can, you know, give us the, uh, you know, the 411 on how, how you how you all um, got this funded. So there was mostly excitement, uh, but it, it's also Cambridge. So um, I think it was more, uh, why couldn't you do more? <laughs> so that was my experience. Natalie or Amy, any, any, any uh, thoughts on that question? Well, I can, at Stockton, you know, we were there from the beginning with um, Mayor Tubbs and um, a couple of interesting things. Like one, there were some murals that were painted uh, downtown. And one was Dr. King uh, with the uh, sort of image of this young organizer sort of in his heart. And, and that mural was interesting because what that was saying is we in Stockton are picking up what Dr. King was doing, right? In his last book, Where We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, he wrote about the, one of the only ways he could see to end poverty in America was a guaranteed minimum income. And so sort of picking up that torch and saying, let's do that. If we'd done that 50 years ago, we'd be in such a different place than we would be, than we are today. So let's pick that conversation up and, and, and drive it forward. And another was um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I thought was a really powerful thing to have um, this kind of you know, image evoking, um, you know, the, the, at the very bottom there's food and there's, you know, um, basic care, but at the top is, is self-actualization. And what would that mean to um, have a community built around um, self-actualization? And uh, so I, it was interesting, you know, those became like selfie uh, spots for folks uh, in Stockton. And it really, um, you know, Dr. Castro was there like in the weeds and I hope you'll speak to that, but it really became a, a thing of interest. People were interested in it. Um, I think there was a clear sense that this was a demonstration that was making, you know, national news that it was all, you know, randomly chosen. People were cheering on folks who received it. Um, and, you know, there was definitely some like, is this for real? Like a lot of um, questions around whether or not this could be trusted, but once it was clear, it could be. And that the money was coming in each month um, it, it became a, a thing, uh, almost a source of pride. Yeah, I'll uh, sort of just add a little bit to what Natalie was saying. I, you know, one of my fears, and this, you know, continues, <laughs> I'll say, as somebody who's working on the research side of these things, is that, you know, not wanting to create sort of like the Hunger Games of Poverty, right, or, or like, you know, this like Willy Wonka golden ticket thing, and like, it, and that's, that's real, right, like we're literally randomizing people into treatment and control, which means the difference between economic stability and not, you know, and as a researcher, that poses some really serious ethical questions for me, um, which I could talk about another time, and, and we certainly talked about that a lot publicly and written about it um but you know one of the ways around that it, you know not around it is in like it's something we don't want to contend with but really asking the question what are we calling people to right so rather than just saying like oh you won or oh you didn't right like to creating some sort of like horrific lottery scenario is drawing on the community to work with us on these experiments. And, and that that has been key, like one, because that's strong science, like we know that, and I've posted some links in the chat to some of the, some of our design. Um, but two, like, we don't know what we don't know, like what we don't know. And the best way at sort of understanding needs in a community is by really rooting yourself in that local context and, and prioritizing that voice in the process. So really taking a lead 
from, from the way that Mayor Tubbs led in that way in Stockton. We've sort of used a similar model in the other places that we're working and it's gone pretty well. And that's not to say that, that there aren't naysayers. There are, and there always will be, right? But knowing that you know, economic anxiety is real, y'all. Like, like people feel that stuff in their body, right? And that's part of the reason that there's so much pushback is because people are feeling the strain of the pandemic, which in, in many cases is just leftover economic inequality from the housing crisis or from years before that. Uh, and so I think one of the, the good things, if I could say this about the pandemic and this current, you know, policy and political moment is that it's, bringing it to public consciousness, the fact that we are all at risk. Like, I mean, the number of people who will hit near poverty in their lifetime is far higher than people realize. So when we're pulling that into conversation and bringing people into the narrative, we can mitigate some of that, some of that pushback. Um, that's not to say that it eliminates it entirely. It's, it's certainly still there. Thank you. you know, one of my favorite stories from the Chelsea um, Massachusetts project that I've been involved in evaluating was one of the lottery winners uh, when it was time to pick up his uh, debit card, uh, called up the, up the city and said, you know what, I, I actually got a job. I don't need to give it to someone who needs it. So it sort of felt like people were looking out for each other as part of the, as, as, as part of the program and, and uh, you know, that, that it really became, you know, it was, it was the community owned the program in, 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 in that way. That's um, very cool. Yeah. Um, all right, we have a couple of questions here that I'm interpreting as being from people who are thinking about the uh, hard aspects of actually setting these up in their own communities. So these are a little technical, but I think they're also could be very valuable to people who are who are trying just to, to actually implement this. One is, is about how hard it is to use ARPA dollars for pilots and whether the accounting and re reporting requirements are, are uh, too painful to, 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 to put up with and in particular, do you have to, on a household by household basis, show that there were COVID losses in order to be able to use those funds uh, to, to, to do a pilot? That's something that for us takes place on the, uh, the programmatic or the implementation side. So I would encourage people to reach out to Mayors for Guaranteed Income or the Guaranteed Income Community of Practice on that question. Um, but I will say people are successfully leveraging those funds for pilots. And I think that's probably one of the, the best legacies of the Stockton experiment is that, that the first one was all philanthropically funded and we've just seen a succession of various ways that mayors, county legislators, you know, and other nonprofit leaders have found ways to leverage various public dollars uh, to, to fund these pilots, which is really how it should be. Philanthropy can't just hold that forever. All right, uh, another question is about whether people who were receiving other benefits have those benefits reduced when they start getting income from these pilots. I, I know uh, in, in, in Massachusetts, the state uh, health and human service agency issued explicit guidance that uh, these kind of programs wouldn't count against their means tested programs, but I'm curious what's happening around, around the country. Oh, Mayor Siddiqui, do you wanna jump in before I give an answer? Cause I know you dealt with this. Yeah, I think it varies by pilot, but we had numerous conversations with uh, the commission of the DTA. Um, we partnered with the Cambridge Housing Authority because uh, you know we, we knew that this would be a huge question for residents. And, Again, that is one of those things where um, Dr. Castro highlighted in some of, in the presentation that the, we got a lot of those questions. So benefit mitigation was a key strategy um, uh, with our pilot and really necessary to really make sure people were comfortable applying. Uh, and so we, we definitely had to par partner with several state agencies and get that waiver. Yeah. So if people want to know to chase this in depth, they can take a look at the paper I linked in the chat a few minutes ago uh, called Mitigating Benefits Loss, something that effect um, that was published in Social Science and Medicine, which talks about that strategy. Um, so here, here's the issue. And there's a bunch of technical ways that you can deal with that. If you take a look at what we've published in Seed has, you can see a little bit of how it's been dealt with in the past. But what happens at the top, like agency director to program director is one thing. But anybody who's worked with social services knows that what happens on the bottom with street level bureaucrats is what really matters, right? So I can have 
a legal memo all I want on the IRS, a legal memo all I want from public housing. But at the end of the day, if I don't do relationship building with case managers, right? Like case managers who are whose literal bodies are tasked with enacting policy, which is means tested and fairly punitive, like in most cases, right? They are incentivized and they're trained to make sure that they're doing clawback, right? And so there's a whole range of strategies that we've employed to try and mitigate benefits loss and make sure that we're not doing harm. And we have to do that per the IRB and, and just per research ethics, right? Um, but just to kind of put that out there for the group that, you know, the, the natural thing, if you're a principal investigator, if you're a lead is to go to another lead, right? But at the end of the day, um, it comes down to case managers and case workers when people are going back in to get their benefits, um, you know, reauthorized or not. Um, and of course, you know, Social Security tends to be, you know, continues to be um, the vexing thing that there, there is no way at this point that we know of um, to protect. And in some cases, we've had across many of our pilots, um, people decline to enroll in the experiment because they're, they're just unwilling to risk um, loss of benefits. And we certainly would not want them to do so. And I'll just jump in and say, you know, one of the benefits of using the tax code to administer a guaranteed income is that it doesn't count as income in the traditional way and doesn't displace people's existing housing vouchers, food stamps, and so forth that are so important to how families are, are making it work. And so, you know, the expanding and modernizing the earned income tax credit, creating a negative income tax, or these child tax credits, these payments don't count as income, and so families aren't being displaced. In a way that when we're piloting it, we have to deal with the very, you know, draconian laws that exist. And I think people have moved mountains to find waivers and to try and like help make sure that this doesn't displace people. But, you know, Aisha Yandaro, who runs the Magnolia Mothers Trust uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, um, actually didn't apply for a waiver. She was one of the first and earliest community run pilots specifically to make the point that this is the type of trade off that our safety net requires of people. And so when she gives her mothers $1,000 a month, on average, they bring home, I think it's like 700 because the rest is in displaced benefits. And that's kind of the point she wants to make that all of this should change. Uh, and I, I, think, um, I think that is powerful. I got a, I guess, somewhat related question, um, which is, has it been challenging to enroll um, people who are not yet uh, citizens in, in these kind of programs? And I can tell you from my Chelsea project where um, Chelsea, Massachusetts gave out um, $400 a month for, for close to a year to 2,000 people. That was a heavily immigrant uh, population that included uh, undocumented people. and and. I think that shows that that it um, is possible to successfully implement uh, a basic income in a in a, in a uh, heavily immigrant uh, community. Uh, I'm curious, uh, Amy or Natalie, any experience uh, on, on that front with, with with any of the other pilots? Yeah, I mean, this it's. I'm so glad somebody brought this up because it's something. If I'd had more time, I would have talked about a bit more in the present formal presentation at the beginning. It's a huge issue, right? So when I talked before about you know where I where I was ending in terms of policy take up and thinking about the New Deal and the CARES Act, you know, yes, we've had success in enrolling people into the treatment group who are in mixed documentation status households, but uh, I. I have to be honest in saying we have had to do double the amount of work on relationship building in the community to build up the trust with um, with households who are rightfully fearful um, that they're going to you know end up on the radar of ICE or, or something something else to that effect, right? And so when we think about moving from pilot to policy, those are the types of questions we need to ask, not just who's eligible on paper, right? But how does the milieu of xenophobia and racism in the United States you know, discourage people from accessing benefits that they're qualified um, for. And it's one of the kind of the key, I mean, I'm asked this question a lot, why pilot, why not just do the policy, right? And part of the reason I believe in science around this is that we have to ask these key questions on implementation to figure out how people are experiencing the program given all the other ways that they're targeted for risk um, and all the other ways that people have been disenfranchised by institutions. So I don't have numbers to give on that yet. It's not something we can do till the very end of, of experiments, but I can say that when it comes down to design, it's it's a core, core issue um, for all the community partners that we work with. 
Natalie, is, is the federal tax strategy one that's going to be challenging if one wants to um, help immigrant populations uh, compared to a strategy where money was given to local governments and, and they had some discretion? I mean, I, it seems our federal government finds lots of ways to make people ineligible for, for things. You know, people with substance use disorders were made ineligible for some disability benefits, for example. And I'm, I'm, I'm just a little worried that a completely federal strategy um, just makes it hard for unpopular groups to get assistance through, through, through a UBI or a guaranteed income. I think what you're naming is the, like, how do we continue to expand who is in the group of people that receive benefits? Or how do we continue to expand our social safety net? And I think that is a challenge. Like right now, uh, that fight is happening around the child tax credit you know, to make sure that it uh, includes ITIN families, families who um, pay taxes, um, but do not have citizenship in the United States. And that is absolutely, you know, the way it should be. We are fighting hard for that. And I don't know which way it will turn out uh, right now, you know, with the child tax credit. So I think that is um, a, an important flag and very much a part of the fight. But I don't think the answer is to leave it up to local uh, governments either. I'm lucky enough to live in California where we've made sure uh, to extend um, the support during this year to all families in California. And there have been notable places where we've fallen short, but that is what, you know, the state's trying to do, but that's not the case across the country. So um, I, I think this is very much part of the fight. Thank you. Um, Amy, we have a question about whether anybody is looking at the uh, impact of UBI on immune function through the um, you know, Im impact on, on anxiety or anything else. And I guess I'll broaden that question to say, are any of the studies doing direct health measurements of cortisol or anything like that in addition to survey, uh, survey work? Um, we're not at this moment in time. I don't, I, there's got to be somebody who is. I mean, for us thus far, we have not done anything that involves the body um, simply because getting through the IRB and design, we really needed to test proof of concept before we went that direction. I think that's probably the next logical space for the research to go. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a research team out there that's doing it that I'm just unfamiliar with. But I mean, certainly, you know, we had toyed with the idea of heart rate monitors and you know, things of that effect when we were first designing Stockton, it became you know, clear very quickly that was not a good path to go down when you're, when you're first um, and you're still testing proof of concept. Um, but I would imagine that those are things that are, that are in the works. Oh yes, babies, babies first years, yeah. It'll be a bit, I think, before they're releasing data, but yeah, I'm certain that they are. Thank you for whoever posted that. Um. So we've been spending a lot of time on the on the uh, I think uh, idea of, of a guaranteed income that's targeted pretty broadly at people who have economic needs. Some of the pilots seem to be focused on narrower populations: homeless individuals, um, youth aging out of foster care, uh, other groups like that. And one appealing thing of using this tool for these more focused populations is you have less of the issue of needing to means test the benefits and create benefit phase outs that create poverty traps. You know, if you, if you have a, if you have a thousand homeless people in your state and you give them all benefits for three years and you say no strings attached, no phase out, you don't get into all the incentive effects that you do. If you have a say classic negative income tax and you lose 50 cents of the guaranteed income for every dollar you, 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 you earn. So I'm, I'm curious uh, when any of you think about this tool for targeted sort of smaller populations where you can sort of serve the whole population and it's only a thousand or 2000 people, you know, versus the use it to try to eventually get to everyone in poverty type of type of approach. So I, I think uh, there's a moment in time when you have to go big. Uh, and I just feel like that's this moment, in, in my opinion. This momentum has been building. What, what I really worry about, Jeff, is that uh, if you saw what happened with the unemployment benefits and those states that just decided, I don't care. Uh, I have a belief that this is going to 
not help the folks I care about, which are these employers. And so I'm doing away with what I know people need. Um, the pushback against that is not more science. I, I hate to say it's seizing a moment when it happens uh, and pushing as hard as you can push. Uh, and I just feel like that's, that's the moment we're in right now. Uh, I think that the ability to tell the story about why it's important when you get to these narrower populations, uh, it matters, but I would say it matters to the persuadable. Uh, I think this, this, this other moment right now is something that's much larger. Uh, I have been surprised at how little pushback we've gotten uh, on the uh, ta child tax credit. I mean, it's the most extraordinary effort uh, in this nation to fight with poverty we've seen in a long time. The universal nature of it, I think, is what allows it to go on. But I also think that it's taken cover from the uh, sort of political moment we're in right now with COVID and, and the amount of wealth some folks are getting in the country that's becoming clearer. Uh, this, to me, is the moment to push hard. Uh, and I would do that and maybe as a fallback position, uh, say uh, maybe we could get some of these smaller things right now. But uh, my sense is I've been kind of stunned with, with how far this has come this fast. Uh, and I worry about putting on the brakes. So that's, that's, there's no science behind it. You have real scientists here who, who have actually data and knowledge. I, I'm just giving you my gut. I won't disagree with you at, at all. <laughs> no, I took like, like plus 10 uh, to, to what he said. Um, when I think about the smaller populations, you know, part of, you know, why we sometimes take those on, you know, in our work and why I think they're key is for us, it's always about human centered design and knowing that our systems have just traumatized people and locked them out over generations in, in ways that they're going to carry with them. Um, just lack of upward mobility and, and really trauma on behalf of capitalism that's not going to go away with just cash. And so for us, a lot of those key questions with the smaller populations is how do we design this in such a way that it's trauma informed? Um, and how do we design this in such a way that takes a cue from some other sectors? So the example I often use is, you know, in fintech, we have hundreds of products for hundreds of end users. And, in, and when it comes to social safety net, we're like, we got one thing for everybody. That's absurd, right? Like, like some people might need a debit card, some might need it bi-weekly, some might need it weekly, some might need it monthly, right? And so tinkering with, you know, how do different populations with different sets of needs engage with the program, I think is the place where we, we need to continue to lean into science that we're designing policy that's equitable, while at the same time, um, doing exactly um, what Jeff is saying, which is to, to seize this policy window that we're in, because it's, it truly is extraordinary. I still can't believe where we are. I mean, where we were three years ago, even I've just, it's hard to wrap my head around how fast political discourse has shifted, but I'm no fool to think it's gonna stay here, right? And so part of my job as a scientist is to help the data catch up to that political momentum, but like people, I mean, yes, this is exciting, but like, come on, as soon as the white middle class recovers from the pandemic, this window is gonna shut. So we have a, a very limited period of time um, to, to, you know, of course, I'm speaking with my data hat on, you know, for, for scientists to bolster the case for the child tax credit and for other things, right? But yes, like we're at a spot where we're ready to, to interrogate these assumptions about how our country is set up, but it will pass. It will pass. Like when white folks recover and, you know, move on and we're all back to work in real life and we're not worried about Delta variants and things of that nature, that window will start to close again. Um, and then it's sort of on us to, to continue the work in that space. Maybe I'm wrong, but if history is any indicator that, that tends to be the way that things go. So I'm gonna um, uh, take the prerogative uh, as the organizer here to thank an amazing panel for their terrific, terrific thoughts and comments and presentations today. This was exactly what we were hoping to do, lift up where the science is, identify what the gaps are, bring in lots of voices, and really think about um, our solutions, our, our solutions to some of the vexing problems that we haven't fixed yet in the moment we're in now. Uh, special thanks to Jeff for um, being our uh, moderator extraordinaire and to each and every one of our panelists for your terrific time together, and especially to our audience. We had a fantastic uh, turnout. We're really grateful to you. We will send the um, link out uh, with the recording. So if you would like to share it with others and really uh, multiply the exposure, we would be delighted. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate everybody's uh, engagement and interest.
Bye, everybody.